A reading from the second book of Samuel. When King David was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God dwells in a tent. Nathan answered the king, Go, do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, Go, tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Should you build me a house to dwell in? It was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. And I will make you famous like the great ones of the earth. I will fix a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old, since the time I first appointed judges over my people Israel. <clears throat> I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. Febum Domini, Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. The favors of the Lord I will sing forever. Through all generations, my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, my kindness is established forever. In heaven, you have confirmed your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. Forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. He shall say of me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. Forever I will maintain my kindness toward him and my covenant with him stands firm. Zechariah, his father, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham 
to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Verbum Domini, Laus Tibi Christe, heard in the entrance antiphon today, behold, when the fullness of time had come, God had sent his son into the world. And uh, we're in that final stretch of Advent, moving quickly towards our celebration of Christmas and the birth of Christ. And if any of us, I mean, we all know what it's like to be in a race and uh, our whole body is aching in pain, but we see the finish line and we can keep going. And so the Lord shows us that we've got to get to that point um, because the, the night has been long spent. You know, this is what we see in the birth of Christ is that the world has been, has been laying in darkness and that because of sin and death for long enough. We've gone about as far away from the Lord as we can and he comes, he fulfills that promise. And it's this new day, this new beginning. Uh, and that's what we hear in this hymn of, beautiful hymn of praise of Zachariah speaking, you know, in praise of the birth of his son, John the Baptist. But seeing in this, this fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham and to all of the prophets, um, that this darkness would end, that this new life would come. And he says, in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. We all look for the morning, such a peaceful time, but it's this promise of light and warmth. You know, we sit in the, the sin and the cold, or the dark and the cold of sin and death, and there's no life there. Uh, but this is what the Lord brings in uh, his birth, his humble birth. That's the, how he changed the course of history, he changed the whole course of mankind with the dawn from on high breaking upon us. When I was in a young priest, you know, we used to have all of our live shows here at EWTN in the evenings. And uh, the joke was always that I wanted to have my own television program on EWTN, but it would be a morning show. And uh, maybe John Nat Bankovic and I could co-host it. And um, the brother said, well, what would you call it? And I said, the dawn from on high. You know, we'd be sitting there drinking coffee in the morning and talking about the issues of the day. But the dawn from on high breaking upon us. One of the translations of this beautiful hymn, the Benedictus, speaks of the tender compassion of the heart of our God being made manifest in this breaking forth of the dawn from on high. Uh, and this is this manifestation of God's love for us, that his heart has opened up completely in this revelation of his love. We come to know him through this gift of the word taking flesh uh, and making his dwelling place among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, in these, I just want to give you a little uh, heartwarming homily this morning, since there's so few of you, and I know there's a handful of uh, viewers and listeners. I just want to speak about what we often are doing, what we find ourselves doing on this uh, day before Christmas, uh, kind of getting the last presents wrapped up and looking forward to exchanging gifts with those that we love. And to keep that in the context 
of the greatest exchange of gifts that we've ever experienced, this exchange between God and man, uh, that he gave himself to us, um, and he desires for us to give ourselves as a gift to him. This is the exchange that happens. We're always the winners. You know, the greatest gift that can be given to us is this gift of salvation, this gift of divine life, this gift of God himself. And that's what the Father does for us. Uh, he hands us this gift, and then what is our response? Is when he says, I love you, he, we're invited to respond in that same way. That with all of our self, uh, we say, I love you in return, and we give our hearts to the Lord. And he delights in this gift, um, as we are to delight in the gift that he has given us. Uh, there's, in, if we think of our, what happens in our human condition with gifts, we all love to open up a present and we have in our mind, what is this going to be? You know, and the older we get, uh, we start saying words like, it's the thought that counts, you know, because we realize in our heart of hearts, you know, maybe this is what I was looking for, but it, there's something deep inside of us where it doesn't fully satisfy if we're really honest with ourselves. But if we think of how we operate as people, you know, little kids, yeah, every year there's this, the, the latest, greatest toy, and we can convince ourselves, if I just, if I just have that, Everything will be perfect, um, you know, but it keeps getting bigger and better and, you know, every year it's something more. As little kids, it's a toy. As a teenager, we think, if I just get that, if, if, if Santa brings me the new iPhone, I'll be happy. So we have the iPhone and within a week, it's just like everything else. And we're looking, you know, for the next thing. When we get to be adults, it's just like, if my wife just gives me that motorcycle for Christmas, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna ask for anything else, you know. And we ride the motorcycle and, you know, it, it's, it doesn't fulfill us. But it's only God who knows how to wrap up the perfect gift that gives us total satisfaction. You know, if we think of that, this gift of the Word made flesh, this gift of Jesus, we're fully satisfied. We have, we have a desire for nothing else. It, it totally gives us contentment of heart uh, if, if, as we enter into that gift given from God. And it satisfies us for all eternity. Now, only God could come up with a gift like that. Um, and that's what he asks us to do. When he wraps up this present, what does he do? He takes this gift of divinity, and he wraps it in what looks like, or what is, our humanity. And so this is what we see in the reality of the incarnation. Uh, and so when we start unwrapping this gift, it's through the humanity of Christ that we uh, come to this full, this revelation of the Father. It's this encounter with Christ, and that's what we do is we read the scripture as we sit in time of meditation, especially as we receive the Eucharist. We're always entering more deeply into this mystery of Christ's uh, humanity, you might say, on, uh, that encounter with him in his humanity, and he's revealing to us what's inside. And we come to participate more and more fully in a share of his divinity. That's what the prayers of the church have been speaking to us about, that he took to himself our humanity in order to uh, give us a share in his divinity. Uh, this is what we delight in, in uh, observing the mystery of the incarnation. This is what the priest says every day at mass as he prepares the chalice. You see us often drop a little teeny tiny drop of water into the chalice with the wine at the time of offertory. And the prayer that we're saying privately is that in this mingling of the water and wine, 
in that mystery that we could participate in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. The divinity of Christ is symbolized by uh, the wine and our humanity is this little part of us we enter in to this share and that we're transformed. You know, we become lost in Christ, in our participation uh, in his life. Uh, and that uh, was made possible because the dawn from on high uh, broke upon us. Uh, the other thing I want to uh, share this morning is about, you know, Christmas is so much a season for little children and it, it's an invitation for us to, re, to be reminded uh, to be like children, to have the hearts of children. We're, we're loved by a heavenly father. And I always marvel uh, when I see adults with little kids that uh, here, and, and this is what I would like us to, to see in this, you know, when you talk to little children, what do you do so often without even thinking about it? You know, they're standing there all on their own, this little person this big, and an adult talks to them and is always stooping down and trying to talk to them in their little world. And isn't this what God did with us? He stooped down to us. He saw us in our need. And so he condescended to our level. And yet, what we're going to see in the decorations of our church this evening is this beautiful image of the Christ child laying in the crash. And what's the instinct for every one of us is we kneel down. And we go and look at that, that little infant, and they capture our heart. This little infant, a little statue of the baby Jesus, captures our heart. Now think of any parent that takes a baby, uh, it's, you know, a baby can be two, two minutes old. And a father or mother holds that child and they're totally consumed by that little baby. And it just, you can't take the, you know, you can't squeeze the little one enough and your whole being just is handed over to this little person the sentiment of the heart of a parent or a grandparent. I mean, everything that I have, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna make sure you're taking care of that. You have, everything's the best for you. You have all of me. And that baby has, if they're absorbing it in, but they have no, they feel it, but they don't know what it is that you're, the sentiment of your heart. Um, and this is what we do with the, the Christ child, that uh, he comes and uh, makes himself little. He stoops down to our level, and then he invites us to stoop down and to humble ourselves before him to his level, you might say, as that little one. Um, a number of weeks ago, uh, I was... Uh, at Casa Maria, the retreat center just down the road from here. And um, some friends I've known since I was first ordained had stopped by and their grandparents now. They had uh, uh, Bradley and Brittany were their children and uh, I knew those kids when they were in junior high school and high school, but now they're both married and have little kids of their own. And so, uh, the parents came by with their daughter Brittany and her husband and their two little children to say hello and Father, it's great to see you and Merry Christmas. And this little two-year-old boy, Gabriel, was busy, he was quiet, moving around, but when it was time for them to go, his daddy picked him up in his arms and I just said to Gabriel, so you're getting all ready for Christmas. And this little two-year-old boy in that high-pitched voice said something he was jabbering, and I couldn't understand what he was saying, but in the context of whatever he said back to me, he said, ho, ho. That came out of his little mouth, and ba, 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 ho, ho, you know, and I kind of was like, oh, okay, whatever that means. And his father said, he doesn't know how to say Santa Claus yet, but 
Father, he under, you know, he didn't say he understands. He said he's getting ready for Christmas and he knows that Ho Ho is coming to visit. And I laughed to myself because I thought, well, I had no understanding of what this little child said, but his father interpreted it like it was this perfect language that this child was speaking French or something, and the father said it perfectly, you know, clear English. This is what he just said to you. Um, and isn't this what parents do, that you are invited to enter into the world of your child, and you understand that. You understand what they need and what they're saying, and you end up communicating at their level. If you look at a little child, they could care less about the problems of adults. I think if children could really articulate in a, a very adult way to us what they would think, they would say, you people are ridiculous. You know, you, what you worry about from day in and day out about what people think about you, about what you're supposed to wear, about how you look. When's the last time a little child ever worried about a lot of the silly things that big people worry about? And it doesn't mean that our problems are insignificant, but if, you're gonna, if we have peace and harmony in our homes, what do parents have to do so often? They have to surrender their own life and stoop down to the life of their little child and enter into the realm and the world of that little person. You start thinking the way they do. You start living according to their schedule. You help train a little one to live according to the schedule of the home. But how many of you, when you have children, as soon as the baby goes down for a nap, you go down for a nap? You, know, you who might stay up until midnight, as soon as you have a little one, when the baby goes to sleep at seven or eight o'clock at night, it isn't much longer and you go to sleep <laughs> because the baby's gonna be up early and so are you. you know, so we begin to coordinate our life according to what's best for that child. The child has no, they're not, they don't know that they have such a power or control. A mother is able to interpret whatever need this child has based on the sound that they make. If I hear a baby cry, whether they need to be fed, whether they need a diaper change, or whether they just want attention, it all sounds the same. But it's an amazing thing to see a mother or father when a baby makes a noise. Most of the time, they can figure out what the need is. It's time to be fed. It's time to be changed, or you'll be okay. You know, they're able to respond according to the language of that little person. And this is what brings harmony in your homes, ultimately. When there's a discord with your children, and they'll make it known, if mom and dad get too busy or preoccupied with their own life, the child will cry. The child will become discontent because they're letting you know, I'm, this isn't working. I can't live in your world and all the stuff that is troubling you, but you need to come and live in my world. And when a parent does that, a child has, is, has delight, has peace. And so this is what God did with us in the incarnation. Ultimately, the Christ child invites us to begin to speak his language, to begin to conform our life more and more to him. And he doesn't say that your problems are insignificant. He says to us, you, you bring those problems to me. You know, you, you share your heart with me. But a lot of the things that distract us as adults, he says, those things you need to put aside. Because for us to speak the language of the Christ child, we have to put all of the kind of the silliness that preoccupies us as big people and that preoccupies us in the world. He says, I'm not interested in that. 
And when you're distracted by all the, the silly stuff that big people do in the world, then we're not really communicating. Isn't that our experience with him? That we can't relate to the Lord when we're preoccupied with the world. And so he says, you put that aside. And just like you are in your rela human relationships between a parent and a child, or an adult and a child, enter into my life. Participate in my life and we'll have peace and we'll have harmony, and you'll be able to understand my language perfectly. You know, to think of that, Jesus doesn't say ho-ho, <laughs> but he communicates the language of his Father, the language of heaven to us. And we want to have an ear that understands his words so perfectly. And the, th the reason that the only way that we're going to understand that is because he's won our hearts over. He's won our hearts over in love for him.